Imagine restoring sight in a person who has gone blind, or repairing pathways in the body destroyed by stroke, or hitting cancer cells exactly where they live. These are the kinds of medical miracles Molly Shoiket works towards every day in her lab at the University of Toronto. She is Canada Research Chair in Tissue Engineering and is a professor of chemistry, biomaterials, and biomedical engineering. And Molly Shoiket joins us now for more. Welcome. It's wonderful to be here. Um, where, did I, where did you get your love of engineering? Well, I think I grew up in a family environment where my parents really encouraged me to pursue what I was good at and what I enjoyed. And uh, I really loved math and sciences. And uh, I had some fantastic high school science teachers. My chemistry teacher in particular, Mr. Mallon, was a fantastic inspirational chemistry teacher. And so that led me to uh, an undergraduate degree at MIT in chemistry. And then uh, in one of our advanced chemistry labs, I made a polymer. And I just thought, what is that? A polymer is a plastic. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's everywhere. You, you know, tires are plastics mm -hmm. or polymers. And, um, you know, urethane coatings are polymers. So we made one in one of my advanced organic chemistry labs. And I thought, wow, this is so cool. This is chemistry that I can see mm -hmm. and I can feel and touch. And so that really inspired me to go get a PhD in, in that field in polymer science and engineering. And how did you come to be at the University of Toronto? Well, my first job after graduating with my PhD was actually at a biotech company. And it turns out that was a fantastic opportunity because we were working in what really wasn't called regenerative medicine yet, mm -hmm. but it was that field where stem cell biology is combined with biomaterials to try and overcome you know, big problems, big diseases that can't be solved otherwise. Mm -hmm. and when I was looking, um, after working for a couple of years, I looked at opportunities to come back to Canada and was really excited by the research going on at the University of Toronto. And what were they doing? Well, Toronto um, and the University of Toronto and the Associated Medical Hospitals, it's just a wealth of research in stem cell biology, regenerative medicine, and also uh, new biomaterials, new engineering aspects. and so. Uh, one of my colleagues, Michael Sefton, was doing fantastic work uh, in diabetes and Parkinson's disease. And that area overlapped with some of the research that I had been doing in industry. And so I was really excited to, to join the, the faculty at U of T. And to be back home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. coming back home was a big draw. Uh, your talk that you're giving at the Perimeter Institute is called Engineering Change in Medicine. Why did you decide to call it that? Well, I think. Uh, what we do is, first of all, we approach medical problems from an engineering perspective. And also, we know that in anything, plan B has to be different from plan A. You know, if you're going to try and change the way things are done, you have to have a new approach. And one thing that's exciting, I think, about the way we approach medical problems is we approach it from a very different perspective than our colleagues in uh, neurosurgery or, or, or stem cell biology. And through close collaboration with them, we can you know, try and answer questions that people haven't been able to answer yet or solve problems that people haven't been solved. Of course, everybody's trying to do mm -hmm. that. But by coming at this without perhaps some of the dogma that you have in traditional training, we think of, you know, solutions or ideas and we test them out that some people might just discard because they're too crazy. Mm -hmm. But because we don't have that dogma, we're not afraid to try you know, those crazy ideas and, and sometimes they work. And how is personalization the future of medicine? Well, I think, you know, we have, you know, if we take cancer, for example, right now already we're starting to see personalized medicine with genomics. and. What we're realizing is that, you know, not every medication is going to work for every person. And so really, if we're going to try and really push the needle and change the way human health is delivered, mm -hmm. um, we have to figure out what's going to be best for that individual. And it's not going to be the right thing for everybody. And how are you applying that personalization to cancer research? So what we're doing in cancer research is trying to figure out how to grow someone's cells in the lab. Mm -hmm. So currently, um, 
it's very difficult to grow patient cells in the laboratory. Either they don't grow or they grow in a way that doesn't represent how they grow in us. Because it's obviously a different environment. Completely different environment. Mm -hmm. Usually we're growing cells on hard plastic dishes. So first of all, that's 2D. Mm -hmm. And second of all, it's a hard plastic dish. So uh, what we're trying to do is grow those cells in an environment that mimics better how they grow in us or how they grow natively. And so, first of all, we're working by growing them in 3D. Mm -hmm. We're 3D, obviously. And many of our tissues are soft, so we're growing them on soft material. So instead of a hard plastic, a soft, it's called a hydrogel. It's just a jello mm -hmm. is a hydrogel, just a water-swollen material. And then providing them with an environment, you know, proteins, other uh, peptides, factors mm -hmm. that mimic uh, so they have the morphology, that they, they look the same as they grow in us. And then what we can do is screen a series of drugs on those cells grown in the lab versus basically screening them on us as patients. How could that change uh, for people who have uh, cancer? Well, ideally, if we can grow your cells in an environment that mimics the way they grow in us and test a series of drugs, then we can figure out which drug would be best for that individual before treating them. We do have um, mouse models mm -hmm. that people use where, where they will take a, a biopsy from a patient and grow them in what's called an immunocompromised mouse. So that's where the immune system has wiped out, been wiped out. But often it will take so long to get the answer. Mm. The patient has already been treated. So it's a, it's a, you know, we have to do things faster, um, but they also have to give us better outputs, right. you know, so better indication. It's fascinating. Um, <laughs> you also do this, though, for blindness. How do you apply personalization to blindness? Okay, so we're working in two areas of blindness. Mm -hmm. One is related to age-related macular degeneration, and one is re uh, related to retinitis pigmentosa. Mm -hmm. And what happens in those two diseases... What is that? Those <laughs> yeah, well, what happens is basically in those diseases, you either lose your central vision mm -hmm. um, or you lose your peripheral vision. In either way, your vision is drastically reduced, and so obviously you can't see well, and so this is a progressive form of blindness. Mm -hmm. And what happens in those diseases is the cells at the very back of your eye in the retina, those cells degenerate. So what we're trying to do in blindness is design a strategy to replace those actual cells mm -hmm. that are lost in blindness. So, so does that stop the blindness completely or just delays it? Right. So currently the way blindness is treated is with drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, and the drugs work really well, but ultimately they only slow the progression of the disease. What we're trying to do in this field is go beyond that. Yeah. Let's see if we can stop the disease. And more than that, let's reverse it. Can we actually give people their vision back? Can we restore vision? So this is um, a fantastic collaboration with Derek Vanderkoy's lab, where his lab has discovered stem cells that we all have in our eyes. And we're working with him, again, to deliver those stem cells in a way that they survive and that they integrate. So if you imagine you have a cable of wires mm -hmm. and you severed it, cut it in half, if you just throw in a bunch of wires... That's not going to work. It's not going to work. So can we deliver the cells and, you know, sort of the equivalence of soldering them into place? Uh, we know in the neural circuitry, if the cells aren't part of it, they're not going to do anything. And it turns out if they're not part of it, they're not going to survive. So again, we've been using materials to inject the cells into the eyes and try and give them that little bit of boost. You know, get them to survive long enough so they integrate. Your lab is also working to help stroke victims. Um, what are you doing? We have the opportunity to work in all these different fields because we're I'd say creating the tools that allow us, the enabling tools that allow us to combat so many of these diseases. Mm -hmm. In stroke, we're also looking at cell therapy, but the holy grail of, I'd say, regenerative medicine is trying to get the cells that are already in us, the stem cells that are already in us, get those to regenerate the lost tissue. So it turns out when a, a person has a stroke, the stem cells in the brain are stimulated, but not sufficiently to overcome 
the devastation that occurs in the stroke. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is stimulate those cells uh, further mm -hmm. so that they actually do promote repair. Uh, how do you do that? Well, one of my collaborators, Cindy Morsed, showed that if you deliver two factors, two proteins, one after the other, directly into the brain, um, you can stimulate those stem cells. But the strategy was highly invasive. So together we thought, why don't we just create like a drug-infused Band-Aid or a little patch that you can put on the brain and then deliver those proteins directly to the brain tissue so they diffuse in and stimulate those same cells that, that we know are there and that we know will respond to injury, but we know need an extra sort of boost to really promote tissue repair. And does it work? So it has worked in, in models of disease. Yeah, we're really excited about that. And you know, this, the challenge now is to go to different models of disease and see if we can you know, really scale this up to make it work in a human. Wow, your brain. <laughs> a beautiful brain. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> I want to move away from the science for a minute and talk to you about research to reality. What is that? Research to reality with the number two <laughs> is a social media campaign that I started with Mike McMillan. Mike is a feature film producer mm -hmm. and of course I'm a scientist. And we realized that there was an opportunity to engage the public in, in what we do all across Canada in research. Mm -hmm. So we're waving the Canadian flag of research and really taking social media as a great medium as a way to let people know what we're doing mm -hmm. and let them know how it's changing their present and their future. What's, you know, what's going on in these labs? So similar to what we're doing now, mm -hmm. uh, but really using you know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube to um, distribute a number of videos. So it's, it's really been fantastic to go across Canada and meet amazing researchers in everything from you know, environmental issues to alternative energy to, of course, health and medicine, but social sciences as well. You know, talk to researchers about Aboriginal literature and, mm -hmm. and immigration policies in Canada, and then um, you know, about the latest cancer research. So. And why is it important to promote Canadian scientific research? Well, you know, all of our funding, most of it, mm -hmm. comes from the government, which means it comes from the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's our obligation and our opportunity to let the public know what we're doing in research and also um, engage them in why it's important. Like, why should they care? Mm -hmm. But if they knew how it's going to give you know, better medical treatment to their their mom or their grandmother or their sister or their, you know, their dad. Mm -hmm. Or just, you know, it's going to impact the food we eat or the air we breathe. Like these all, or just our cell phone that we use. You know, all of these things impact us every day. And, um, you know, it's that, you know, inventing the future is what's going on. We'd love them to participate as well mm -hmm. because we know that so many sectors of the community have to come together for anything to be successful, whether they're in business or, or research or in medicine, or just, you know, they have that core passion to learn more. I'm also thinking that maybe you could even plant the seeds for young minds or, you know, future right. scientists and... Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And um, we've started to work with some high school principals about getting the research to reality videos into that curriculum. I've incorporated it into my own classes at the University of Toronto. Uh, yeah, so it's, it turns out it's just a fantastic resource. And so many resources um, highlight other people, not necessarily Canadians. So it's, you know, it's that pride in Canada, similar to what we have in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. You know, we're featuring our rock star researchers. Just like we send our best researchers, our, our best athletes to the Olympics, mm -hmm. we're featuring our, our internationally renowned researchers. And because you come at problems from the perspective of an engineer, um, does this free you to think about things like cancer in a different way? I think so. Um, I think that we have really 
have the opportunity to think about cancer and all of the diseases that we work on in a different way. But we really rely on our collaborators. Mm -hmm. And I have Why is collaboration important? It's really important because first of all, think about stroke, mm -hmm. a thousand failed clinical trials. Those people weren't stupid. Those were really smart people trying to solve a really big problem. It's challenging. So nobody can do it alone. And then also we work with people who have um, who bring a, a synergistic approach, you know, mm. they are a different approach to solving the same problem. So they come with a lot of knowledge and domain expertise that is complemented by ours. So we couldn't do half of what we do without our collaborators. And then it's more fun. You know, mm. it's a great experience. We learn so much in the process. And then we also have the opportunity to contribute. And now, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're doing something that no one else has been able to solve yet. We only have about a minute left, but um, I wanted to ask you this final question. Uh, we sometimes hear about major breakthroughs in laboratories, and but then once the headlines die down, mm -hmm. um, they seem to just disappear. Why does it take so long for a scientific breakthrough to move from the lab to a patient? It's a really good question. The, uh, there's a huge amount of work that has to go on to go from the lab to the patient. First of all, we have to demonstrate it's safe. We have a lot of regulatory hurdles to go through to make sure that what we're giving to the patient is safe. And then, of course, it has to work. And sometimes things will work in a model and not work in the patient. So there's a lot of work that, and, and then because that regulatory process is so stringent, it can take a decade at least, mm -hmm. sometimes 20 years, to go from the lab to the patient. You know, things have to be done over and over again reproducibly. You have to have a product that meets a certain quality. And then, of course, it has to be safe. Thank you very much for being here, Professor Shoykat. We've learned a lot. From, I've learned a lot from you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.